start seeing bits and pieces of their life. What I didn't know one pleasant morning while strolling with Dan Schachter was that in collaboration with my scheming producers, he was setting me up for a test of my memory. Now we're just going to witness a simple picnic scene. We want you to pay attention to how often either of the folks gets up and down. So whenever someone gets up and down, you just make a mental note of it. Okay. I knew Dan Schachter to be a noted memory researcher, but this picnic was a surprise. Mm -hmm. Do you like some pasta? Yeah. Oh, good. I love to watch people eat. Although Dan had told me to keep track of how many times the picnickers stood up, I suspected there was more to this little scene than that. But what? I wasn't to find out for another two days that the picnic was part of a carefully choreographed attempt to implant false memories into my brain, to make me remember as real things I'd never seen. At the time, it was like trying to keep track of a very bad play while sitting uncomfortably close to the author. Oh, it's cold. After 10 bewildering minutes, the picnic mercifully Bravo. came to an end. Very nice. Well done. Very nice. Well, it could use a little more high drama here and there. Yeah, yeah. no, but it doesn't lack for slowness. It's good. <laughs> At this point, I was politely asked to leave. Starting with R. The scene was played over for a stills photographer. But this time, it included things that had never happened while I was there. Ignore the sun. Which means I also missed Dan Schachter's basic premise, that okay, memories right are malleable. One of the things that we know about memory is that it's not fixed at the original experience we have. The way we talk about the event later, uh, the way we think about it, uh, can affect, improve, or sometimes change our memories. And photographs are one everyday source of reviewing past experiences that may have a, a potent effect on memory. And we're interested in exactly what that effect is. Okay, thanks. I want you to look at each of these for about 10, 20 Two days seconds. later, I was in Dan Schachter's office at Harvard University looking at photographs. Get cut out. Is it well centered? For each photo, I'm going to ask you for a one to five rating. Oh, I'm. <laughs> See, part of me is trying to figure out what this is really a test of. I'd have to say, uh, you know, four. Four, four, for, four to 4.5. Okay, you know, it's a nicely composed picture. I didn't believe this rating ploy for a minute. But I graciously played along, even when I knew the photos were of things I hadn't seen. I take it you don't want me to mention whether or not this was a picture of something that happened or not, because this never happened. Right. We're not concerned with that okay. right now. We're just concerned with your... Showing you how smart I am. <laughs> right. In all, I looked at about 20 photographs. Finally, the moment I'd been anticipating. Fishing pole. The test. No. The question is, did I see these things at the picnic or not? Umbrella. No umbrella, no. <laughs> potato chips. No, the potato chips were in the picture. Well, I remember them in the picture, but I don't remember them on the site. Okay, so you're going to call I was doing yeah. fine until... Um, nail file. Yes, I think I remember her filing her nails, although... The picture is, is also vivid in my mind, but I think I think I remember her filing her nails too. Kite. No kite. No, there was no kite. There was a kite in the picture, but that's it. Okay. A man's cap. Dan was obviously trying to confuse my memory of things I'd seen for real. I think he wore a cap. With things I'd only seen in the photographs. Well, see. I think he was wearing a cap in the photographs, and I think and I remember when I looked at the photograph, there's something wrong with this picture. I don't think he wore a cap, okay, no. So. A bottle of water? Yes, there was a bottle of water. Uh-oh, uh this would come back okay. to haunt me. Folding chairs? No. No, no way. Pasta? Yes. You think I could forget pasta? <laughs> come on. It's over. Yeah, that's it? It's, that's it. It's out of so your system. So it had nothing to do no with more. how many times they stood up. Well, that was just to get you to pay attention to the, what was going on in yeah, front of you. That's why I paid attention to everything else. Now, what I'm really interested to know is, were you able to place in my memory things that never occurred in real life yes. by using the photographs? You did? We you did. You did? Even though, um, even though we, you know, we, we told you, you knew what the game was. Yeah. You knew that some of the things that we were showing you in the photographs had never happened. <laughs> Despite this is, that... This is horrible. One was <laughs> the nail file. Yeah. 
That was only in the photo. You know, when I first saw the nail pile, I, there was as little uncertainty. Is that real or isn't it? And then a second later, I, I was sure I had seen it. In the final tally of eight things that appeared in the pictures only, I wrongly remembered two as having been at the picnic, the nail file and the bottle of water. The photographs had somehow lodged in my brain right along with my memory of the picnic itself, and I couldn't tell which was which. To understand how this can happen, we have to first understand where in the brain memory is located. Is it possible to point to some place on the brain and say that's where memory is? Well, there's no one place. There's no one place I can point and say, there's your memory for high school graduation, yeah. and there's your memory for having eaten breakfast yesterday. Instead of being in one place, uh, many of us believe that the memory is kind of scattered in different parts of the brain. The idea is that memory consists of all the bits and pieces of an experience, the sights, the sounds, the emotions, with each fragment stored in areas of the brain responsible for handling that particular sensation. So sounds are stored in the auditory cortex, sights in the visual cortex, and so on. Keeping track of what's where is a region of the brain called the hippocampus, which functions as a sort of index for our memories. Recalling an event means reassembling all those bits and pieces. It's not like replaying a videotape. It's more like shaking a kaleidoscope. With every shake, every recall, the pieces fall together anew, sometimes as in my memory of the picnic, including bits that don't quite belong. Okay, so here's the first list. Dan Schachter recently wondered if he could tell the difference between real and false memories by peering into the brain while it was remembering. Uneven. Twelve people heard word lists Smooth, like these, roads, and they had to remember as many of the words as they could. Writer, um, gravel, What's sneaky about the lists is that while they're each united by a theme, they don't contain the most obvious word. Bed, rest, awake, tired, dream, wake, snooze, blanket, doze, slumber, snore, nap, peace, yawn, drowsy. Sleep, doze, bed... Open. There, right off the bat, I said sleep. But sleep wasn't on the list. Again, I'd been given a false memory. Uh, bed. The 12 experimental subjects all got PET scans while doing this test. Recalling both true and false memories mostly involved the same bits of brain, especially the hippocampus, the index region. But while the true memory lit up the auditory cortex, the false memory didn't. So even though the subjects reported hearing the words that weren't there, their brains appear to contain no trace of the sounds of the words. So in a way, you really can look inside somebody's brain and tell whether they're having a true memory or a false memory uh, under certain conditions. Under certain conditions, within this one experimental paradigm in a group of, of 12 people, we were able to see uh, some differences uh, between true and false recognition. Dan Schachter emphasizes there's a long way to go before this first faint trace of a false memory can be turned into a practical test that could be used, for instance, in a courtroom. Meanwhile, discovering how easily my memory can be tricked was less than enough for me. What I think that this really brings home to me is it's very important to say not this is what happened, but it seems to me that I remember this is what happened. I think that's a very important lesson.